idea. Um, you know, one of the announcements that Kenny brought forth was the balloon raffle. So before we even get started, I'd, I'd like to lift that group up to you. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do in our youth's lives. They're exercising some huge faith in taking this leap and planning this, this big mission. Um, thank you to Elsa for taking lead and helping pull all the troops together and rally the rally the uh, fundraising efforts. So I think it's going to be really cool. So I pray for God's hand between now until the time to go. And then once we take that leap of faith and we actually jump on that airplane and fly what seems to be clear across the world to Alaska, that our youth are going to be stretched in some ways that they've never been stretched before. And I think that's what it calls us to do is to kind of squirm in our seats and stretch ourselves a little bit and grow. Because if we're not growing, we're staying the same. Um, and it's because of God's mercies and God's grace that we have the opportunity to be able to fly across the world and share the word of God with some people that were probably, we, we may develop some relationships, but some of those people we're never going to see again. But we're going to plant some seeds and some seeds that hopefully at some point in time are going to grow into something beautiful for them as a person, but even in that area. Um, so let's just go to the God this morning in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I lift up the entire church congregation here to you. I lift up all the families, all the souls represented. I, too, lift up the um, Alaskan Misha trip and the youth that's involved with it. Lord, I pray your, your hand of blessing and favor and safety over the entire process and the entire trip, Lord. Lord, I, too, lift up and I pray Jesus over, over everybody's lives here. I pray that we can all quiet our minds and you can help us quiet our minds and focus on what you may have for us through your word. I pray, Lord, that this morning is about you and your edification and your glory. It's about your word. And I pray, Lord, that something within your word will, will stick with us and we can take it out and we can apply it to our lives as we leave here this morning. Lord, we love you and, and thank you. Thank you so much for all the amazing blessings. Thank you for the rain yesterday. Thank you for just letting us be able to wake up this morning and have breath in our lungs. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So this morning, there we go. So this morning, um, the title of, this, of the sermon I'd like to share is being different. I mean, God calls us to be different. And I think as we talk about the mission trip, that's one way that we're being different than the world. We are taking God's love and we're just going out there and, and the desire to share that love with, with the world. So this morning we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. So we're actually going to have a little two-part series here. We're going to go through Romans chapter 12, the first half this week. And then on February the 11th, we're going to conclude with the second half of um, so if you don't mind, let's just turn our Bibles to chapter 12. You all have your Bibles with you this morning. Lift it up in there if you got it. Or if you got a phone. I bet everybody has a phone with an app on it. So let's, let's just read the Word of God this morning that we'll dig in. So in Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to his measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So this morning, I'd like you guys to ponder one key question. That one key question is, what does it look like to be different? And then second to that, are you different? Not conforming to what the world sets as the standards, 
and their expectations, are you truly different? I heard a story this week as I was reading through scripture and I was listening to um, a couple podcasts. There was a story about this little boy and it was Valentine's Day. And they were in class and for Valentine's Day, the teacher gave this assignment. They had these paper and there were four hearts on each piece of the paper. The assignment was simple. It was stay in the lines, color each piece of paper, each, each heart red. Once we get done with them, we're gonna cut them out. We're gonna tape them to the wall. So this one little boy, he was sitting there, he was trying to color in the line. You know what, this is kind of silly. He started scribbling over the whole page. He said, you know, I could be much more effective if I get outside of the lines and I just color the whole page red. Then I can cut them out, and there we go. We got it. That's, that to me was this example of how we are called through God to color outside of the lines. We're not called to conform to this world and follow suit of what the world always tells us that we have to do, but rather it's okay for us to think outside the box and get into the word and, and seek God and color outside the lines of the world that, that the world gives us for us. But it's because of those mercies of God. So over this past month, I know Matt, uh, uh, Mark shared a couple of, uh, sermons from Romans. During the, men's, during the Bible study on Wednesday evenings, we've been studying the book of Romans. And what was evident is in the book of Romans, you have chapters 1 through 11. And it talks about all these, about the doctrine and the mercies of Christ. And it talks about salvation, Christ's birth, his death, the resurrection, how we can identify with Christ, the grace that we can experience because of Christ, and a promise that Christ is going to be with us during trials and tribulations. It gives us confidence in God's love and how great these mercies are for us. So then here in chapter 12, it's kind of this pivot point where Paul then says and gives some, some instructions about what we can focus on and how our faith in Christ can truly transform us. So we have essentially the theology and the background. Then here we get into this real life application of what we're called to do as Christians and as followers of Christ with Christ in our hearts. So through the word of God, we gain an understanding of how we can experience, how we can experience the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. So as we turn our lives over to God and experience God through Christ's crucifixion, Essentially, our old self is buried and we're risen as a new person. A couple of comments that Mark shared last week, um, he commented that our old self is crucified through the blood of Christ. Because of Jesus and what he did for us, we can let our old self die. We can be free from the pursuits of the power of sin and darkness. We live in a, fall, in a fallen world. It's challenging out in this world to not pursue those sins and that darkness, but through Christ, he enables us to be able to do so. Our passions and pride, they don't have to rule over us because, again, of the mercies and grace of Christ. Satan tells us lies. It's all a lie. He tells us how the flesh is so great and how that's, that's what we should be doing. But the fact is that if we're chasing the flesh, it's going to pull us right down into bondage, right back down into slavery back into this fallen world that we live in. So we all have spiritual battles going on in our minds and our, in our lives. The good news is that these spiritual battles define us. The world and who we are in this world doesn't define us. What does define us is who we are through Jesus Christ. And it's out there. We just have to seek and be intentional about seeking after Christ. Romans 8, it's a couple of verses that are very paramount and very pivotal for this walk in Christ. It's Romans 8, verses 8 through 9. And it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. That last sentence, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. If God dwells in you, you are in the, in the faith. So who, are this, who, who here this morning can affirmatively say that the Spirit of God dwells in you, that God dwells in you, that you are a Christ follower. So as we study, again, Romans chapters 1 through 12, I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, crack your Bible open. 
there was just so, so much there. We've been working on Romans for what? Three, two, two months and, and Wednesday nights? And there was just so much there. Even in Romans chapter 12, there was so incredible amount of, of information and application points within Romans chapter 12. So this morning, we're going to share, attempt to share, hopefully through God's grace we can, four applications of how our lives can be transformed through the will of God. Have you guys ever thought to yourself or commented to yourself, man, I would really like to live in the will of God? Or how do I know that I'm in the will of God? I know, speaking for myself, we've been faced with these every now and then, this idea of, do I need to live here? Do I need to go here? Do I need to go talk to somebody? These are all instances of, it's important that we are in the will of God. So again, in Romans 12 is this transition to the truth of how we apply God's word. So I put the scripture up on the screen here. We're going to kind of go through and dissect the various verses here and talk through some application points. So there in verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. There's two words I want to emphasize here. The first is appeal, and the second is therefore. Whenever you appeal to somebody, you're saying, hey, I want you to understand this. I want to call attention to this. So he's wanting to call attention to all these mercies that's been described leading up to, verse to, to chapter 12. And then he says, therefore, and that's because of the gospel and our ability to have salvation, as described in those other chapters, here we arrive here. Here's the application points. He says, hey, listen up. I want you to understand this. You need to apply all these truths to your life. So chapter 12, again, is the start of real life application. And then reading on in verse 1, it says, continued, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So application point number one. By being a living sacrifice, we exercise and apply God's will for us. Effectively, we are able to live in God's will. By the mercies of God, we are able to go out and present ourselves as a living sacrifice. In the Roman context, if you had a living sacrifice, it was an animal, an animal free of blemish. It was a perfect animal. It effectively was a living sacrifice. But for us, this means that we're sacrificing and we're giving God, we're transforming our mind and our body and our soul and our spirit and our actions, everything about us, we're giving it over to God and say, God, let me live in your will. It's truly turning it over to God. But that's a very challenging thing to do, to turn over your entire body, your life, everything over to God. It's saying, God, take control. How many of you guys like to give up control? You like to give up control. That is a tough, tough, tough thing to do because we're mortals. It's tough. We want to have control. We want to wake up in the morning. We want to have control of our own destiny throughout the day. But therein is living in the world and it's living for us versus living for Christ. And if you notice in the scripture here, giving your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, it's not a particular task. It's not a particular act. It's not a thing. It's the concept of thousands of small things throughout each day that is edifying to God. God just doesn't want your works. He doesn't want you to, to come to church on Sundays and be here. I mean, he wants you to be here, but it's not. it goes above and beyond that. It's not just the act of coming in and sharing God's word in a single instance with somebody. It's not going to work and sharing God. It's not just what we do, but it's our thoughts and it's our experiences. He wants you. I mean, that's how I would sum it up is he wants you this morning. Whether you're a youth, so if you're Arrow sitting here in the front row, he wants Arrow, he wants Josh, he wants Jaron, he wants Guy back there in that back corner. He wants all of you. 
And it's not just one day he wants you. He wants you for the eternity of time because you are his. In Luke, Luke 16, verses, verse 10, he says, He who is faithful in very little is faithful in very much. He who is faithful in very little is faithful in very much. You've ever heard the practice, practice makes perfect, or the saying practice makes perfect? Small things over time make it a little bit easier for the bigger good. It's, it's easier to say, yes, God, if every day we're, we're intentionally seeking out specific instances, it's those little thousand things throughout the day, collectively those thousand things throughout the day, they equate to a bigger good. And if we practice that day in and day out, and that's where our mindset is, it makes it easier for us to turn our whole self over to God and say, yes, God, I'm here. But that's, that's like, that's everything. That's your hobbies. That's your pastimes. That's what you do whenever you're home alone. That's what you do when you're out with another brother, a group of brothers and sisters. That's when you're at school, kids. So here in verse one, he brings forth the mercies that are given to us. Because of those mercies, that is why we can offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Because of all the mercies that he gives us. Salvation, grace, peace, life, justification. I, I like thinking that everything we do in, in life is a process. It's about a big process design. Whenever you get into the car in the mornings, you put your key in. It's a process, right? You put the key in the same way every time. It's an input, and the output is your car starts. If I get, if I flip the electric or the uh, light switch on, electricity goes to it, and what happens? The light bulb pops on. It's the same thing with our life through Christ. It's an input and output. If we're inputting Christ into it, what are we going to get in the output? Then we're going to get something that's beautiful because we're living in the will of Christ. That's the output. Is the will of Christ. But ultimately, it's because of the Holy Spirit, because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. He died on the cross for our sins. He gave everything for us. That way we can have these, this grace and these mercies that allows us to be able to be a, a living sacrifice. Without that, just we can't be a living sacrifice. We can't seek things that are holy. Application point number two, don't conform to the world. In other words, don't copy the behaviors of the world. It's going to get you in trouble, youth. It's going to get you in trouble, kids. Even adults, don't copy the behaviors. So here in verse 2 we see, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world has customs. There's ways of doing things. It's a fallen world. You flip the TV station on for about five minutes. And I guarantee you, you're going to see a series of about 10 things that's of the world, that's going wrong, that they're trying to push towards you. Those things that are going in the, in the wrong in the world, we don't have to succumb to those. We don't have to be subject to those. Now, we're going to live in the world yet, but because of Christ, we can experience God's love for us because of those mercies. So the idea of transformed and conformity. I think it's pretty cool thinking about what the word conformed means. Conformed is being compliant with socially adopted standards. It's being compliant with what the world says you should do, how you should act, where you should go, what you should support. Whereas being transformed, that's something completely different. And it includes our attitudes, our beliefs, and our actions. To transform means you have a dramatic change in appearance, consistency, and character. So the Bible calls us for, for us to be conformed. So this morning, you guys have probably been wondering, why did I put this bowl and this fake Yeti bottle up here in the front? So imagine for me, an object lesson is always good. I loved these as a kid because I could actually wrap my mind around something. If you tell somebody you need to be transformed, I think of the Transformers movie where this bumblebee car transforms into something different. And that's effectively what we're getting here. So imagine for me this morning that this little cup, it's full of water if you can't tell, is your mind. 
So there in scripture, it says us for not conform, but be transformed in our mind. So then imagine this little, uh, this little dropper of food coloring. It's all this stuff in the world. It's those individual th thoughts that we have. Maybe we cheat on something. Maybe we watch something we shouldn't be watching. It just keeps going on and on and on and on, and it pollutes our mind over time because we're living in the world. So the Bible calls us to transform our mind. So now it's blue. Effectively, if I sit here long enough, it's going to be entirely blue. It's going to, our, our total mind is going to be blue. But imagine with me then, this is the word of God. This is the Bible. This is our relationship with Christ. So then I'm going to take this guy and what would I do to this to try to get this to change? If I just stood here and I'm going to wish it to change, is it going to change? Brayden, do you think we could stand here and count to the count of three and this clear up? You think that could happen? The answer is no. No. It's not going to happen on its own. It takes action from us. So imagine then with me this morning, this big water bottle is the word of God. It's building this relationship. It's prayer. It's this ongoing relationship with Christ. When I add it to it, it's like a continuous flow. Eventually, I'm transforming myself here. My mind now isn't full of junk. It's become, all this junk is becoming more and more dilute. And every single day, those thousand things that we say that we do every day, we wake up, we go to church, we eat, or we go to work, we eat with each, we, we eat lunch, we go shopping, we watch television show, whatever those things might be. The more and more we do that, the more we continually fill ourselves up and replace ourselves with God and with Christ, it cleans our mind and it transforms our mind. And then now, it's all clear, if you can tell, it's all clear. But around me then, all this junk still yet in the world, even though it's not in my mind, I'm still surrounded by this stuff. So to make sure that, that these little ideas here don't keep dropping back in there, I got to keep with this ongoing stream. I got to turn that water faucet on, that water faucet, that, that relationship with Christ, and I just need to keep pouring it in there on and on and on. Whenever I get that bad thought or that, that lustful thought or that, that greed or that notion to cheat or that notion to do something wrong or watch something I shouldn't watch, I need to crack open God's word and say, God, I need some help here. I'm praying to you, God, help me with this situation. And your cup's going to be overflowing. Your mind is going to be overflowing with good stuff. It's going to be overflowing with a biblical view versus a worldly view. So that's where we are right now. We're in a worldly view of things. But through Christ, because of those mercies of Christ that's described in Romans, we can experience that transformation of our mind. We can have a clean mind, a clear mind. So by offering up your worship to God, what does your worship look like? Have you guys ever thought about that idea? What does your worship look like here this morning? It looks a little bit different for each of us, but there's a lot of common characteristics there. It's about exalting God. It's about edifying God. It's, it's not just our prayer, but it's also our day-to-day -day walk. Later on here in the scripture, Paul's going to talk about gifts of grace. Those gifts of grace are worship to God. So in, in short, this is the difference in a cultural view, a worldly view, and a biblical view. A worldly view many times is based upon feelings. Have you guys ever heard somebody say, how, hey, how, how do you feel today about this situation? How do you feel about your job? How do you feel about your teacher in school? How do you feel about your spouse? A life by relying on feelings and feeling alone it isn't going to cut it. Merely feeling something and doing something doesn't equate to a transformed life. A transformed life is a change in heart. As a, To the next time you think about how do I feel about something, I would challenge you to ask a couple different questions. As opposed to saying, how do I feel about this? Maybe you could say, what does God's word say about this? Or what does God say to be the truth in this scenario? What is the instruction in the word of God for this situation? 
See, feelings, that's something that's about you. Whenever I feel something, that's about me and what I think. I appreciate the men's prayer breakfast yesterday. The topic was talking about what does a delighted heart look like? Psalms 37, verses 3 through 7. In short, it says, trust in the Lord, take delight in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, and be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Focus on God's word. And again, it's that relationship. By doing so, again, that's another way that you can be in the will of God versus the will of the world or what your ways or what your thoughts are. So those verses in Psalms effectively sum up the idea of being a living sacrifice. Have you ever said, I want to live in the will of God or wonder how to live in the will of God? Recognize God's mercies and make yourself that living sacrifice. Here in verse 2, continued, it says, Paul says that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Then by testing you may discern the will of God. So whenever you test something, you're measuring against a standard. So here in the scripture, God gives us a new standard. It gives us that benchmark that we should be comparing and that we should be living our lives towards trying to achieve. As I pondered this idea, I thought about Mark, actually. I thought about construction. There's a, something called a plumb line. I've never once used one. I'm okay with it being a little bit hot. But a plumb line, essentially, it, it's weight at the end of a, of a line that you would be able to gauge and see if a wall is straight up and down or be able to get a perfect vertical line because of it hanging down. So in Scripture, it took me to Amos chapter 7, verse 8. Amos was given this vision, and he said, Behold, and these are the words from God. It says, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. Essentially, a representation of how those having faith in God should live their life. A measure of divine judgment. When you are tested, how are you going to respond? God uses this example to measure the faith of the people in Israel. So as we measure our faith, along with that comes a, the ability of a sound mind to be able to make good judgments. Judgments about right versus wrong, truth versus non-truth, what is good, what is bad, what is perfect, what is impure. So by transforming your mind through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, it allows you to be able to make those judgment calls. Essentially, you're, you're using Christ as this test, as this litmus test, as this filter to be able to know what is good, that I should be the input into my mind, and what is bad. That way I can avoid those things. So by testing, you're able to approve or reject by knowing what is best. You guys ever heard, Mama always knows best? Well, and sometimes Mama could be wrong. God knows best. God knows best for all of us. Application point number three, practice humility. Don't have an overinflated view of yourself. Here in verse three, it says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned here, basically, Paul is basically saying, hey, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest about yourself. Measure yourself by the faith that God has given you. Again, later on in this passage this morning, we're going to hear some of those truths. But this particular verse is a verse to remain humble, remain in humility. It's submission, it's submitting yourself below Christ and recognizing that Christ has all this under control. Everything we do in life, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's about Christ and what, what, what his will is for our lives. So as we live and interact with each other, it's not a competition. We all have different gifts, and it's about using those gifts for the greater good and for glorifying and pursuing God's kingdom. 
I will never be able to get up here and play the guitar or sing like Travis does. That's a gift that he has, and it's a gorgeous gift. I will never be able to build a structure like Mark does. That's a gift that Mark has. I will never be able to take care of little toddlers like my wife does with that loving nature. I mean, I love toddlers, but it's a gift that people have. And God gives us all different gifts within this body here. But going back to the idea of humanity, of humility, it's not thinking more highly about ourselves. But when we do think more highly about ourselves, this is where pride can creep in. Pridefulness. It prevents our mind from being fully transformed. C.S. Lewis, he stated, pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. I recall this instance back when I was in high school. I used to play the saxophone, and I was, was pretty decent at it. Annually, I would audition for these all-district um, uh, bands, an all-district jazz band, and I usually did pretty well. And then I would, I would audition for the state. So this is all the high school kids in the state going to this competition and seeing who is the top of the top within the state. So when I was a freshman, I was in the top. When I was a sophomore, I was in the top. When I was a junior, though, I went and auditioned. And I would suggest pride and humility maybe getting the best of me there. I didn't practice as hard as I did. I didn't apply myself as, as I should. And I went to the, to the audition. And guess what? I got third. And guess what? Third, you're not even playing in the band. You're an alternate. You're a bench warmer in case somebody gets sick. But that was, that, that was a good thing for me, though. That was a gut check for me. That was me thinking that, hey, my skill level might be a little bit higher than what it really is here, but I still need to apply myself and practice on a daily basis. But I grew in that moment. I grew in that moment because this was like Jesus saying, you know what? I've given you this gift, but in a moment's notice, I can take it away from you. Your pridefulness is getting the best of you here. But conversely, I shouldn't have thought poorly about myself. I should use that energy for something positive then. That's where the sober judgment comes into play. Had I been exercising sober judgment throughout this process, maybe it would have been a different outcome. Maybe God had his will that, hey, I wasn't meant to be in it this, that year. But it takes faith to step away from me, myself, and I, doesn't it? It's a view of, of not being too high or, or, or haughty with yourself. That takes some good faith right there. So he's the plumb line, again, that we should measure ourselves against, that standard that we should measure ourselves against. On Thursday, there were a men's text. Um, James 4, verses 6 through 10 was shared. And it says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I like that. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. That key lesson is through prayer and through God, through seeking after God and pursuing the Holy Spirit, there's hope for all of us. But that word intention, Brad mentioned intention this past Wednesday night. We have to take, we have to do things. We can't just sit idle by. Similar to that little cup of water right there representing our mind. If I just sit and watch it the whole time and never take action and do anything, it's still going to be the same substance as what it was an hour ago, as what it's going to be a month from now, as what it's going to be a year from now. But I have to intentionally pursue Christ through his mercies and transform my, brain, my, my mind. A fact is, is that if you don't have humility, you get pride. You get one or the other. So it's the opposite of God's will. Pride is the erosion of God's work through you and manifesting itself. Going back to that C.S. Lewis statement of pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up the possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. 
Application number four, this is the last application. Use whatever gift you have been given to serve others to the best of your ability. Key word in there, use and to serve others. For verses four and five, it says, for as in one body we have many members, and the many members do not all have the same function. So as though we have more than one body in Christ, individually members one of another. So here in the church, we're all believers living in grace because of the Holy Spirit. We are all one. We're all individual people though, with different individual perspectives on things, different opinions, different gifts. We're all unique. Not one of us have the same characteristics about us. We have different hair color. Some of us, like myself, don't have very much hair at all. But we all have different characteristics about us. And as the Holy Spirit comes over us, we're able to unite in harmony because we're all pursuing that same common goal. It's the edification of Christ. So I refer back to that jazz ensemble. Each instrument plays a different melody. Some play harmony. Some have a lead. Sometimes an instrument may have a solo. Some lay down the bass line. There's a rhythm section back here behind us. But that product is this harmonious masterpiece. It's very edifying to your ears, but it's edifying to God as well. So even though somebody has a solo in the middle of that tune, it's not about that person. It's still about that, that, that group as a, as a whole. And guess what? Whenever we are using our spirit, it's like the best paying job we could ever have. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is what? It's death. But because we are participating in the body of Christ and putting ourselves out there and exercising whatever that gift is, we can seek eternal life. So no matter what our role is in verse three, each, each member has a position, no one greater than the other. Our role within the body of Christ isn't based upon our profession or our opinion, but through the Holy Spirit. The relationship here is much more mutual and common than any external organization, much more meaningful. When you look at a business, any job that you have, how do you get that job? You get that job probably based upon maybe whatever degree you have and education that you have, or it's who can be able to do that job the best based upon man's terms. But here within the church body, verses six through eight, it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace God has given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Again, all of our acts, it's for the edification of God. That's, what we're, that's why we do those things for us within the church. Sometimes we have supernatural gifts. We have things that are just beyond our wildest dreams. If we were going to try to do that as our own person, would not be, we wouldn't be successful. Some are integrated within our personality. Some personalities, they're able to kind of feel and experience what somebody else is going along with them or maybe identify a feeling and know that, hey, I need, I think I can go here and I can put my arm around that brother or sister and I can impact the life. No, I can lift them up because I recognize that, you know what, they're, they're struggling right now. Sometimes it's our, our training over the years. If we go to school or we've done a profession and because of that, we have this great skill set, it very well could be a gift, a gift of grace, being able to come and share it with the entire body for the glorification of God. <clears throat> Charles Hodge, he's a theologian from the 1800s. He quoted, if Christians are all members of the same body, having different offices and gifts, instead of being puffed up one above the other, instead of envying and opposing this each other, they should separately discharge their respective duties diligently and humbly for the good of the whole, not for their own advantage. It goes back to humility and being humble again, as earlier in this passage 
not for one's own personal gain, but it's the idea of giving our gifts for the benefit of the whole. That's one thing that I really appreciated about our church. We all have different abilities and you see them being exercised. Some people come on their own time, they vacuum the floors and they, they, they keep the fellowship hall clean. We have folks that um, volunteer with, with the, uh, a school. That, that's a gift. Sometimes with those gifts, it's for the moment. Have you ever, have you ever been out with somebody, maybe, maybe at school or just within your, within your job, and you're having this conversation, and you get this little nudge in your heart that says, you know, I need to share the word of God with this person. And you get nervous, and your palm of your hand starts sweating. It's like, what am I going to say? How am I going to introduce this? And then somehow, by God's grace, whatever you say comes out very fluently, and it's meaningful to that person. And even if it's not fluently, because of God's grace, it plants a seed with that other person that you are sharing it with. That's because of God. God is good all the time. God is good. And he's going to take care of you, even in those situations. And he's going to allow you to be able to exercise your gifts if you're living in the will of God and you're pursuing God. So... Because our minds are being transformed, we can share that love, we can serve, we can give according to the measure of our faith. The gifts that Paul lists here, it's not an exhaustive list. There's many others, but there's six particular ones he calls out in this passage. He calls out prophecy, serving, teaching, giving, leading, exhortation, and mercy. So the first one, prophecy, just a little bit about each one. So prophecy, this is telling the heart of God. According to our faith, as he was crucified and he was the resurrected son of God, it isn't necessarily telling, foretelling the future, but it's sharing the word of God. It's being open to be able to go out there and put yourself out there and share the word of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says, to the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. It's edification, it's discipling people. That's one of the main calls for us here as a human on earth is to disciple people for the glory of God and for Jesus Christ. The second is service or ministry. Our actions are a ministry of God. Maybe helping prep for a potluck meal, running the sound equipment back there, cleaning the church. It's out of love and for the glorification of God. It's the spiritual acts of ministry. And these impact the various body here within here. The third is teaching or discipling or instructing those around us. Maybe this is with somebody to share the word of God with. Maybe it's an official office within the church where that is your role within the church. Maybe you're not called to that particular office, but that doesn't mean you still can't teach. It doesn't mean that you still can't share. It's those opportunities within a moment's notice in the heat of the battle, you're there and you have, you're right in front of face to face with somebody and you can teach somebody something about the word of God. It's that seed that you're planted. Exhortation, that's practicing what you've been taught. I would suggest that teaching and exhortation goes hand in hand. It would be a travesty if you're always taking in, taking in, taking in and learning and learning being in the word of God, being in the will of God, and you never have an output. You're never sharing that word. So practicing what you have taught, what you've been taught, and urging others to do something different or urging others to, to learn and grow themselves. Giving generously. That's the next one. It's your time. It's your finances. It's yourself. It's being a physical sacrifice. That is your spiritual worship. The food bank ministry, American Heritage Girls, Trail Life, Hope Academy, those are all acts of giving generously. Maybe it's, it's your tithes, it's your offering, it's your time. It's investing in a project here within the church body. It's investing in the time for maybe one of our brothers or sisters here going to their house and helping them with something. That's giving generously. 
leading with zeal and being perseverant, being a leader. We are all called to be a leader in some form. Don't give up, though. It's, it's difficult to be a leader at times. Hold true and keep pursuing with all of your energies. Show mercy with cheerfulness. Share your love and want to show love. This kind of goes hand in hand with being a leader. The ups and downs as being a leader. The scripture tells us that the devil wants nothing more than to seek, kill, and destroy. Whatever that ministry is that you're tapping into and participating with, the devil wants nothing more than just to be able to put his little claws into it and try his best to rip it apart. But as a leader, hold true. Keep pushing on. Whenever you're challenged, keep pushing on. You may be a leader, don't even know that you're being a leader. But if you have some other people that you're working with and that's following you, you're being a leader in your own way. I recognize those feelings that we described earlier. Whenever you start feeling kicked in the shin, you start feeling that something's not going right, I suggest you open that Bible up, get quiet, be patient, get into prayer with God, and let God talk into your heart and your soul. That's going to be the biggest pick-me-up you could ever, ever, ever hope for in your life, is that pick-me-up through Jesus Christ. So however you contribute, give it your best. Give it your all. Each of these gifts, they align with that idea of transforming your mind. God grants us gifts and allows us to have those spiritual gifts. But it's about intention. So this morning as we get ready to wrap up, we're going to do communion here in a little bit. But I, you know that, that song, Speak Jesus, that, that was really good. I enjoyed that this morning. I would encourage Travis, if he doesn't mind, the rest of the worship team to come up. Um, just singing and praying that, playing that song. And the right there where you're at this morning, this scripture is up there on, on, the, on the screen. I challenge you to read it through to yourself and do this little mental checklist within yourself and saying, where am I within Romans 12 verses 1 through 8? Have I submitted myself to God? Have I recognized those mercies that he has for us? Do I experience that salvation? Am I experiencing God in my life? Am I experiencing the Holy Spirit? Do I have a relationship with Christ? Do I know what my gift is? Where am I within this church body? Am I practicing my gifts or am I just holding it to myself and keeping it for myself? Am I operating in this feeling type space? Am I pursuing the, the, the wants and desires of the world? Or am I in constant prayer with Jesus Christ, with a relationship through Christ? Pursuing after something that's much, 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 much more bigger than you or I. And that's something that impacts the entire church body. It impacts each and every one of us here. And as you read through that, just close your eyes in prayer for a moment and speak Jesus over your life. Speak Jesus wherever your struggles are, whatever your hangups are right now. If you got something big that's on the horizon, Speak Jesus over that. Quit trying to do it for yourself. Let God take control over it. Surrender yourself to God. Humble yourself to God.